Welcome to Desk of Lady Ada. Hello, everybody, and welcome to yet another Desk of Lady Ada Maker IO edition. We are continuing on our path to glory, our 10 video series about maker to market, how to take your maker invention and bring it to market. And uh, we're basically halfway through. This is the halfway point. We're at number five. That's right. We have. Um, Thank you, Floating Philhead. I am Floating Philhead. Um, so. Uh, We've so far we've covered uh, design. Mm -hmm. um, that was the last one. Yes. And uh, what did you? And we'll we'll go through uh, mm -hmm. some of the other ones in a second. But um, what was the major things in the design video that's led up to this point tonight, which is prototyping? What is what is uh, what's the theme? What's the the vibe of design? Good question, floating Philhead. Uh, in design. We basically, you know, every step is a bridge between the previous and the next step. The previous step to design was where we set up our uh, bill of materials and decided what the pricing was and, a pro you know, what our requirements were. And then in design, we actually spec'd out parts. We, like, played around on the DigiKey website and found, like, the lowest cost thermistor, found a good temperature sensor, found a, a three-axis accelerometer. And then in design, we actually... Um, laid out all those parts in Eagle CAD or whatever your favorite CAD software is, I mean, KiCAD or OrCAD or Altium or what have you, you get those into your prototype PCB, and it's demonstrated here. Uh, this is a, you know, a drawing of the PCB, but we, we do the layout and we kind of decide you know, our final prototype, which is kind of a little counterintuitive, but you know, you're, you're going to send out PCBs. They're not too expensive, but you want to pretty much get it as close as possible to your final design, get everything you want on there and test points and get ready for prototyping where you'll actually figure out like, can you write this firmware? Are these sensors even gonna work? Um, getting everything into that PCB, that's, that's kind of when you know you're really, you're really doing it. So yeah. the prototyping, you're really getting it done. And then um, after you lay out all the parts, make sure they fit into the enclosure uh, shape that you want. You send them out. We should have had to send them out with Oshpark for a quick turn prototype PCBs. Yeah. Per perfect purple PCBs. So um, just to recap, so far we've done concept, research, evaluation, design, which you just talked about. That was mm -hmm. last week's video. And now we are up to da -da -da -da, prototyping. Prototyping. Yeah. So prototyping, if you go to maker.io powered by DigiKey, um, prototyping, as it says on the site, the prototyping phase of any project can be tasking, in part because it's often time consuming. You'll be creating Whew. the first physical model of your project, which means a lot of time testing, debugging, and validating your idea. You'll probably need to beta test and appropriately revise your idea, which can take significant amount of time. Prepare for iteration after iteration. So, Lady Ada, when you hear the word prototyping, because I remember a time when manufacturing, you didn't really hear prototyping along with mm -hmm. it. It was more like everything was giant scale. There was no, none of this like oh, prototyping phase. Yeah, it's none like of this prototyping phase. And now like prototypes are like cool and rare and like, oh, look at this prototype, rapid prototype. Um, what do you think of when you hear the word prototyping? Prototyping for me is definitely getting, you know, that first PCB, soldering in the components, testing each one. Um, you know, when you lay out the PCB, sometimes you have breadboarded it, like I did a little bit of breadboarding, but there's always little things that you, you catch you. You know, you're, you're not going to get it right the first revision. In fact, we sometimes do up to eight revisions of a PCB design as we figure out the shape and location, you know, your, your, where your antenna is going to be, how close these sensors have to be to each other, you know, uh, interference between components. That you're getting into, like, the physicality. It's, it's starting to go from your brain into reality, and so it's, it's this... This is kind of where you get a little bit of the impedance mismatch, right, of, of the vision in your head and the reality. Um, so that there can be a lot of, um, not pitfalls, but you struggle as what you imagined was going to happen kind of hits with the reality of what you can do with, you know, your budget, your tool set, um, you know, your bill of materials and, and what's available to you. Okay. But it's also good because it's like you're, you're, getting, you're doing it. Okay, so this is one of the um, uh, phrases I've heard you say. It's like you bring up a board, yes. right? Like you, this is this is the, you're gonna you're gonna solder one up. Yeah, we're gonna do some bring up. Um, I'm going to bring up a Rev B because actually all the Rev A PCBs, the the original purple ones, I have they all got working and I sent them out to people for um, analysis, which is part of the prototyping. Is is you know I have a group of people who are like excited to beta test, and so you know once you solder together your prototypes. 
and you bring them up, you can send them out, uh, which is kind of fun too. We won't be shipping anything today, but we will be soldering, so we'll put together some prototypes. Um, you will have to hand assemble your prototypes. You will eventually get into um, machine pick and place assembled, but your first 10, 20 boards, you're gonna be hand assembling them. There ain't no way around it. And it's a good idea for you to do it and not outsource it because you can do testing at every step to see like, rather than build the whole thing and find out like, okay, there's a short somewhere, do it step by step, test the power supply and then test the microcontroller and then test one of the sensors and test the LEDs. You do it step by step. Okay. So, um, my favorite thing to say, to the workbench. To the workbench. So yeah, where I'm gonna go and around. Yeah. Right. I'll be right back, but um, we're going to go to the workbench and actually get the yeah. hot air station Head over going. there. All right, going. Okay. All right, workbench. Here, here we are at my workbench, which is just around the corner from yeah. the computer desk. But um, this is where I'm actually going to do all my soldering. This is where I do my assembly, disassembly, debugging, prototyping. It's got my tools. I've got a um, Hacko soldering iron here and some clips. And I also have a really nice little hot air station, which I will use because we've got some uh, leadless parts going on here. Um, you know, water bottle and an oscilloscope. Um, I've got a fume vent, which I use if I'm doing a lot of soldering. And um, a little parts bin, which all has all my parts in it, and they're all labeled. And these are really handy when you're prototyping so that you know, you usually buy parts on cut tape, but then you have to kind of fish the parts out. So this is really nice. It'll flip top storage bins. So yeah, we're going to get right to it. What do you think, Phil? Yeah. Okay. And then um, you had me print out this um, thing here, which is, uh, yeah. This thing. Yeah, so, this so I have it on the screen here. And thank you. Know, you. Up, yeah. This is the stuff sheet. So this is what we're going to use as we solder in the components. It's basically... Um, the outline, and then the placement, and then the part um, number. I don't use the part names so much. I just, I just have the part um, value there. And um, we'll use that for soldering in all of the components. Okay. So I've got a, an overview of the workbench. Yep. Ready, set, go. <laughs> um, and uh, we'll go to the overhead. Okay. And uh, the PCB. Yeah, you can see it all nice. Device. Okay. Yep. And I've already put uh, that in ahead of time. All right. Okay, and so we're gonna turn off. Go for it. Turn on my iron, and then we get a multimeter, and get that ready when we need it. Okay, so my soldering iron is warming up. We're gonna start by doing the power supply section because it's the easiest to test. After that, it gets a little tough to like you know test in order. Um, so let's pick out. We're gonna need the JST. Let's pick out a JST connector. And I like to kind of lay it on the PCB near where I'm going to solder it. I also need, sorry, one second. Finding all of these parts, two 10 microfarad capacitors. And you usually, uh, just because I've known you for a while, you usually have uh, your circuit board in a pan of ice. I do. I like I like the pan of ice quite yeah. a bit. I think um, you've had that one for like 15 years. Oh, you know, easily. Like, yeah, this is like time. my my first one that I bought when I started Adafruit. But you know, they last forever. I lost the little thing on the side. But yeah. Whatever. Okay, so I've got two shocky diodes, two capacitors, um, and I need the regulator. So I decided on the AP2112K. Let's see if I can. This is the hardest part: is locating the part in my massive bins. Okay, so while I was doing that, my soldering iron heated up. So let's uh, get right to it. I'm going to use, you know, when I solder prototypes, I actually use lead solder, but um, you know, leadless solder is fine too. I just find lead solder a little bit easier to work with. I've got my fine tip um, because pretty much everything I'm doing is um, fine pitch. And then, uh, yeah, you just surface mount soldering. I mean, you know, if you're doing a kit, you might be able to get away with through hole parts, but that's gonna get tougher and tougher. Um, pretty much every component these days, you know, only comes in surface mount. So learning how to surface mount solder is a skill that you're gonna have to pick up, even if you're used to through hole soldering, because when you get to manufacture, it's also a lot more expensive to get um, 
through hole soldering done than surface mount. Through hole soldering is like a hand or a, you know, a selective solder machine process. You want to minimize that because uh, soldering in something that's through hole will cost you, you know, 25 cents or, or 50 cents a piece, whereas soldering something that is surface mount is like two cents a piece. It adds up quite a bit if you have, you know, 50 components, which is not unusual. Okay, here's a question. Okay, ask. Does uh, it matter that you'll eventually be using lead-free later? Does that have any um, implications that you're using lead now for prototyping? It doesn't um, really. You know, the, the, it's, it's just a process. Um, you know, when you order your components, of course, you'll want to make sure that all your parts are Rojas. Even if, unless you're doing something military spec, in which case, you know, you might be required to use um, lead solder depending on the specification. But if you are... Um, making something, even if you're only intending to sell it in the USA, you should get Rojas components. And it's not like certification is something that you actually have to get tested for. You, you just buy parts that are Rojas and then, um, hold on, let me just get this diode polarity right. Uh, you just buy parts that are Rojas and if everything in your design is Rojas, then that's it, you're done. Okay. So when you go to websites, DigiKey specifically, since you know this is kind of a DigiKey thing, they indicate if it's real or not. They do, and also the you know there there sometimes are variants of parts. So just make sure you get the variant that is Rojas. Um, it's it's actually quite difficult to buy Rojas non Rojas components these days. The only time is you know we were talking earlier about how I wanted to use a photo cell, and photo cells are no longer Rojas. You can still buy them, but they are not Rojas certified. But you know even if you're not planning to go to Europe, it's inevitable that um, American you know, will, American companies and, and retailers will eventually want Rojas only. Um, or you never know, you might end up having a popular product and you want to send it to Europe. You're going to need to provide um, Rojas certificates for all of your products. Kind of inevitable. Okay, so I'll get these diodes in. And then, yeah, just do one part at a time, slow and steady. Okay, let's do the regulator last. While you're doing your prototyping, you might end up using parts that are a little easier to solder. Like, there are some times when it's like, okay, this part is available in BGA or QFN, and you're like, okay, look, for the prototype, I'm gonna do QFN or you know, TQFP or whatever to get it, make it easier to solder. But, you know, you will eventually have to go with a BGA part for some reason, so just, you know, be aware of that. You can you can solder BGA parts. It's just it's just difficult. And then don't forget your wick when you make a little bridge. Okay, so that's the um, that's the power supply. I might as well do the LED while I'm at it because it's kind of May as well. Might as well. So I'm going to do the on LED. So that LED is green. Would you say that you brought up each Adafruit design you've done? Have you done a? Have you done this for every board? I think I've done it for at least ninety percent of the boards. Yeah. Was there? Any, is there ever a time that you're not going to make a prototype for something, or do you always? Oh, we always make a prototype, but sometimes um, K Town, who's the um, another designer and another engineer on staff, he'll sometimes do the bring up, like we're doing some NRF 52 stuff right now. And yeah. he, I solder it, to, you know, I, I actually do solder it together, but he's the one who actually does the bring up on it. Just because, um, I will say, if you have an oven, it's a lot easier to use uh, paste than to hand solder. Uh, so if we were at the uh, if we were at the office right now. It would be a different process. You would use the solder paste and just place all the parts and then let it run through the oven. Yeah, that's what I do. And it's, yeah. you know, you can do it at home, but if you're only making one and you don't have a really awesome oven, I don't think it's that much easier. I mean, it's, it depends a little bit on the design. Okay, so let's try this out. Power this up. Oh, okay, on. You can see that? Yep. So that's good. Nothing caught on fire yet, so let's check the voltage. And again, this is kind of the last part that's easy to test by hand, but we might as well. I got the multimeter here, and I will measure between ground and three volts. And yeah, looking good, okay. Nice. So as you place each part, 
if it, they can light up, you light them up, and then you also test the voltage. I mean, yeah, this is the voltage regulator. Do it first because if you get that wrong, you can destroy everything else. Mm -hmm. So doing the voltage regulator and, and just getting, making sure your power supply is really clean. Normally, I'd actually take up my oscilloscope and actually see the voltage, making sure there's no spikes or anything. But just to keep it easy, I'm um, only using the multimeter. Okay, so next up, we're going to actually have a little bit more fun. We're going to show how to use uh, paste. So this is, I actually got a sample of this maker paste, but you can buy um, paste solder paste in um, you know, all sorts of syringes. I used to buy them actually from DigiKey, and I, I remember that old syringe I had for like four years? Yeah. So you can, you can buy uh, lead or lead-free solder in a larger syringe, but this is a kind of a cute little package, and they sent me a sample, so I thought I would um, I'd try it out. And this is, it's kind of nice, because it's like kind of heavy. It's basically, you know, you have solder that comes in a wire, right, and then inside, it's very hard to see, but there's a, a little hole that goes all the way along the wire, and it's stuffed with rosin, the flux. And so as you solder, the outside metal melts, exposing the flux, and the flux is what makes the smoke, and it cleans off the area to make it so you get a good solder joint. So that's why you want rosin core flux. You can't use acid core flux. That's what's used for plumbing because um, it's good for plumbing because it etches away at the you know, copper pipe to make it a good contact, but it'll destroy your electronics. You need rosin core flux. Likewise, um, paste, solder paste for electronics, is little balls, like miniature little teeny itsy bitsy like ball bearings. But they're like really, really small ball bearings, uh, and they're in a liquid flux. Like it's the liquid part is the flux, and then it's just got all these little mini balls in it. And then when you heat them up, the balls melt, and they're surrounded by flux. And so that's kind of how they make it fluid. So this comes in a tube, and then when you squeeze it, a little bit of paste comes out the end. So for some parts, you can do this with um, a, uh, a soldering iron, but I thought it'd be a good demo. So let's like, you know, do the um, chip in the center, which is the accelerometer. So for this, I'm gonna squeeze, oh, it's like tough to squeeze, but you squeeze and kind of spread on this paste. Getting um, a syringe is actually kind of nice. I mean, this is this is totally fine, but if you have a syringe, you can really get the paste down exactly where you want. And then I use um, tweezers to kind of clean it up a little bit and just sort of spread it around so you maybe get it exactly the way you want. Make sure all your pads have a little bit of paste coverage. Good. Okay, and then you get the component. So, this 3D accelerometer. So, pick out the part. And yeah, you can see this is a QFN. Um, it's a component that uh, has pads only on the bottom. So, it's it is actually impossible to solder by hand because, unlike some components, the pads are only on the bottom and they don't come around the side. So you do have to use paste and hot air for this. I mean, yeah, you pretty much have to. There's, there's no way around it. Whereas some QFN parts, like if I grab the at Mega. And, and I can zoom in, so I'm going to zoom in. Huh? I zoomed in, so it's looking good. Oh, yeah? yeah Sorry, one I can, second. I can see the paste in the... Oh, is this like the one? I didn't, I forgot to bring a chip maybe. That would be hilarious. Oops. <laughs> okay, well, one part was forgotten. Um, but some, some parts that are surface mount, they have um, pads that go all the way around, and so you can solder them um, by drag soldering. But for this one, you can't. So we'll grab this part, and then, yeah, so we just have to make sure, even though there's pads only in certain locations and the paste is all over the place, it's fine because when we solder it, um, the solder mask, little the black mask between each pad will keep it from shorting too badly. And then we look up on our diagram to make sure we have pin one set up correctly. And try to place it as close as possible. And then you're gonna use hot air. So you can actually get a hot air station for about a hundred bucks. Um, and it comes with a vacuum inside of it. It's all in one. You turn it on and then you just set the air control to be really low, the temperature to be about 300, 350 degrees. And then you just really carefully, like, and slowly 
heat up the area until the solder paste melts. So turn this on and it heats up very fast. So be aware and, and or careful of that. And another thing you have to watch out for is the air will blow your part around. So you want to heat it up, but not from the top only, so it doesn't uh, get pushed around and, and shoved out of the way. And as you heat it, you'll see the paste kind of go gray, and then it will, like, in a split second, turn liquid. Oh, neat. Yeah, can you see the yeah. liqu liquiding? Okay, so this is about to turn. Yeah, the side near reset turned and then... Yeah, you have to really heat it up, but there you go. There it goes! And it's like, wee, like liquidy, and then... That's electronics. And then another nice thing is you, you'll center it. When you push the part around, it'll actually self-center. And if you push it down, it'll squeeze um, all the excess paste out. So you kind of have to like push and squeeze a little bit. Okay. You know, this is it's a little bit weird, but that's what you got to do. And then that's it. And that's hot air. So it's a good tool. You want to use both. And then you actually still want to go in with your um, soldering iron when you're done. And what I like to do is just clean up by using a little bit of solder. And you're not melting the solder on the pads. You're actually using the solder as sort of just a way to clean up mm. all the excess. It's like a little, it, you know, it acts sort of like a glue. It, it picks up the excess paste and then drags it away. So I've noticed that with um, this part, sometimes you have to go back and do a little bit more love to it. You know, like you might have to remove it, replace it because there's a little bit of paste underneath. When we actually were in manufacture, it's not a problem. It's just that prototyping it is, is a little challenge. Okay, so let's do um, the reset button next because we're right up here. Let's see. Mini tactile. I personally find it very relaxing. So you just do a little bit of soldering. Well, you like to play video games. It's kind of like a video game. It's very video game-like. Okay, so let's get the... I'm going through all of these parts that we've got here. Okay, I got the Mega Oma Ray. Let's do those. And you used to let me know. Let's keep going and, and showing off soldering techniques. And you let me know when it's uh, time to take a break. And I will. No, just keep going. Back. Keep going. Everyone's okay. fascinated. Yeah. Okay. Just like, oh, look at this. Yeah, prototyping is takes quite a bit of time. But I'm just trying to show you, you know, you can do it with a $100 soldering station. Like, you don't actually need um, crazy special tools. Okay. All right, next up, let's do the ceramic crystal. Okay. 
This is also a part that has all the pads on the bottom, but I found that you can kind of get to them from the side a little bit. If you lay down one pad of solder first and then like melt it and get this part down, you can then get the other parts too from the side. This is actually where I like to examine from the side, make sure it's, check all the pads and everything. Looks good. Okay, let's do some of the passives. So I'll do a 1K here, the 222 ohm. So you get some capacitors. I'll just get all of these passive components done. And then I put the component right next to where it goes. And this is why I like 0603s. If I was doing 0402s, this would be really challenging. One thing I also don't like too much about 0603s is they don't have part markings. So when you have 0805s, you can see the value of the component. But with 0603s, they don't usually have them. So. out of that bin. Sneaky little bugger. Eh, gotcha. Okay, so it's 22. Um. Okay. Doot, doot, doot. Solder in a six of threes. Any other questions while I'm waiting for no, they're my hands? Okay. Oh, these actually do have very small markings on them. These, the 22 ohms, but the 1Ks don't. That's actually another thing I've noticed. Like sometimes when you get resistors, they have markings on them and some companies no longer mark. So I personally will pay even, you know, it's only like a hundredth of a cent more to get ones with markings because it makes it easier when you're in production. And um, one of the things you can get in production, which I don't use that much, but other people do, is automatic optical inspection. So when you do optical inspection um, during manufacture, the manufacturer will actually use like, you know, basically OCR, but for components. And it will look, you know, to make sure like, you know, it can't like really tell what's going on, but it can say like, well, there's a rectangle here and there's like, the text 105 is over here, and then there's a silver thing over here. So it, it can do some basic analysis of what, you know, is in place. And so that might be something to think about while you're prototyping is like, do you, if you're gonna use optical inspection, you have to make sure that every component is visible. And what components are you gonna pick that can be optically inspected? Okay. Let's grab some, let's actually grab a 10K thermistor, actually. I don't have any. It's where they must have fallen out. Okay, let's grab a uh, 10K resistor then. Over here, and then another 10K from over here. Oh wait, you know what? I did have a thermistor and it totally fell out. See, this, this is how far a small an 0402 is. I mean, that's ridiculous. Like, it fell out, I didn't even notice it. I was like, hey, I don't have any thermistors, and I actually did, but they're so teeny. They look like dust. And these are not even the smallest components you can get. You can get much, much smaller components. So 201, 0201s, 0105s, I mean, they're, they're nearly impossible to see. And I would have preferred not to use a 402 thermistors, but it actually was cheaper than a 603 by like a, like a cent or two. And I was like, well, you know, whatever, I might as well go for it because it meant, you know, again, when once you're manufacturing, it doesn't even really matter. Also seemed like did you had more of the 0402 ones in stock, made me think like, ah, this is a more standard size. Okay. 
All right, we're getting there. Look, yep. halfway done. Let's do the micro USB next. And uh, yeah, well, once again, the, this question comes up, but uh, yeah. I'll ask you. So why did you go with micro USB? Um, micro USB is, you know, in my opinion these days, the standard for connectivity, and it's pretty small. So let me get this paste. I'm going to use paste for this because it's a little tough to get in there. So I just put a little sliver of paste down. And you see how that these are slots, but they're plated slots. The, the, the gold, the copper, the gold plated copper goes all the way through. And then they, there's these um, mechanical points here. When you actually solder this in an oven, they'll be paste down and you know it'll heat up. Um, I'm not going to do that for this, but I am going to uh, solder these through hole parts pretty well. But if you, when you do your surface mount production, it actually, um, the paste that gets placed on those pads is enough to um, keep them in place. And the mechanical strength is like really great. So like once, once you have those through hole parts, through hold, even, even in a surface mount process you can do it, which like I didn't realize, which is why I didn't use micro USB for a long time, because I thought, Oh, they, you know, these have to be hand soldered or, or soldered by selective. And then like later on, I, I realized, um, no, they actually are done in a surface mount process. It's pick and placed. And then there's just enough paste to um, make the part, you know, attached all the, all the way through. The, the paste kind of leaks through. It's something you can see on this one a little bit. You see there's a little bit of um, like a halo. That's mm. the um, paste that leaked through during assembly. And you know, this is just paste left from a stencil, but it's, it's enough to uh, mechanically connect it. And then... And do you recall which, which one this is that you like because this is gonna get um, USB cables uh, plugging and unplugging this quite a bit. What, yeah. So, sorry, what was the question? Yeah, what, do you recall which one this, what, this is? Which connector? Yeah. Oh, it's just, it's one of the ones that's mixed surface mount through hole. I don't remember the exact part number, but, um, you know, they, they have them on DigiKey. Just look for ones that have four legs that go through the PCB, right? So that the PCB has through hole slots and slots don't cost anything. You just have to figure out how to get your PCB house to make them. But once they make them, you know, this fits yeah. in very nicely. It sits in place and you don't need um, location bumps, which can... You know, which sometimes if you're doing all surface mount, you have a location bump to, to keep it mechanically centered. Most uh, devices that have only surface mount pads, the enclosure provides strain relief. But honestly, I would, I would still go with through hole, half through hole, half surface mount if you can. Okay, next up. I'm going to put in the light sensor. And the light sensor is the first component that I don't recall completely which way it goes, so I'm going to look at this reference. Okay, it looks like the dot's on the left. Hey, cat. What do you do when a house cat jumps up on your workbench while you're trying to solder? I, I usually um, yell at him and he goes, what? And then... Yeah, I don't think he is, but he's, he's looking. He's, he's definitely looking. Yeah, I know, cat. You're like, this is the one time you want attention. Do you usually bring up boards at the Adafruit factory or uh, at home at night? <laughs> um, I usually do it at Adafruit because, again, I can, you know, what I do is I use, we have a pneumatic paste dispenser, which is kind of like this, but a, connected it, to a foot pedal. Advanced maker. So this is, but what you're doing right now is more this is accurate of, of what maker to market is. Cause yes. The, yeah, you're. Look, I just bring up a board every, you know, I bring up like tons of pr prototypes every week. I bring up like yeah. 10 boards a week sometimes. So you, you want to have a pneumatic paste gun that'll like, you know, put dots down and you use a, use a foot pedal and it'll just like eject a little dot of paste and then we place the parts and then you go through the oven. It's very fast. You can do a whole bunch of prototypes at once, but it's not realistic for um, yeah, for home. For, for home. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't really make much sense. Okay, here's another 10K. Yeah, so this is interesting. So I added 10K pull-downs to this design, which is interesting because usually you would use a pull-up, 
but I actually really wanted to have the logic for the buttons be um, like positive, not negative log logic. So when the button is pressed, the pin goes high. So that way when you say like if digital read, you know, button pin, you know, then it's, that means it's pressed. And um, the AVR does not have the ability to put in optional pull downs on pins. It only has optional pull ups. So it's one of, the, one of the things about the AVR platform. So, you know, these two components are required. If I ever um, revised this design to use a different chipset, I might be able to get rid of those resistors. And every component does count. You know, every component that, it's not even the cost of the component, but placing the component, and then, you know, that component can, can cause problems. It can be wrong. So anything you can do to get rid of components will make your life easier. You really do want to minimize them. Okay, time for buttons. These lovely little buttons. Okay, buttons activate. Okay, next step, there are some more passive components. Actually, let me do this op amp first because this is going to be difficult to solder in once the passives are done. So let's do the op amp. This is the LMV. And this is an actually, it's a funny op amp. I'm using the same op amp that's used in the Arduino Uno because I just needed, you know, a generic op amp. But we buy a lot of these, so I was like, well, you know, we're already getting a pretty good price because we're buying so many. So recycling components is something that I do to minimize inventory frustrations. Like if it's something that I already have a lot of, even if it's a little bit more expensive, I'll go with it. I got some really tightly packed parts in here. Let's get the one microfarad. Oh, yeah, uh, what's up? Some, some blacked out. Did you? Uh, oh. Bump the HDMI. Yeah, we're back. Okay. okay. Apologies. Kind of cool that it just came back. Um, yeah, I think you just pumped the HDMI. Okay, panel. I will be more careful. Well, we're doing something not normal with all this stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's a reason you don't see a, a uh, electronic video series of people bringing up boards like this. Um, we hope someone does. Yay. All right, so now I'm doing the resistor divider for the... Um, Microphone. The microphone, initially I was hoping I would be able to just read the voltage right out of it, but it's actually pretty low voltage. It's only like a couple millivolts, and so I need to stick an amplifier on there. Again, I was kind of thinking, you know, if eventually I upgrade to something like the SAMD series, it has a um, differential amplifier, and so, you know, I might have been able to amplify the voltage without, you know, needing a... Um, without needing a, uh, an op amp and all of these like passives, but for now this is what I got. 
Okay, so I did the 20K, and I'm gonna do the 10K. There's like half a dozen one microfarads on this board. Okay, so this is the 10K, and then I've got the one microfarad over here. Okay, so I also have to do this little microphone. That microphone is also a surface mount component, and it also has the pads on the bottom, which again, isn't a big deal when you're at pick and place stage, but is annoying when you're at this stage. So it's a digital component, MAM's microphone, and it has the four pads on the bottom. So let's use a hot air again. We'll get, this time I'm actually not gonna use paste, I'm gonna use a different technique. So another thing you can do is you uh, melt solder on all of the pads, like so, and then you can um, use that as your, you know, your solder deposition. So, hold on. Get this over here. Okay, so it's going to sit right there. Get the hot air gun. Yeah, see, it blows away the parts. You have to be careful. You have to grab it. And hold it in place while you wait for the... Whoa. Okay. The only thing is, I kind of bumped it. I'm going to grab a new one. I accidentally decapped it. So I'm not gonna risk it. I'm gonna grab another one. Don't risk it. Don't risk it. That's why you have multiples. That's why you get a lot of prototype. When you get prototype com uh, components, be sure to get like 25 of each. Actually, I'm going to turn down the heat. One of the nice things about this, the paste, and, you know, the solder and, and, and hot air, though, is once you get the component situated, though, it really does sort of, like, fall into place. Okay. So that's that. All right, let's do, let's go continue on our, our passives journey. Uh, next up, 1K, 100K, 10, 10K, and one microfarad. It's really one of everything. So I'll grab a uh, 10K, 10K goes here, and then I'll grab a 100K, and that goes over here. Don't mix up your 100Ks and 100s. I've had that happen to me. Okay, 1K is here. And then actually I have a 0.1 microfarad as well. Goes over there. One microfarad goes up here. And then 100 ohm up here. Okay, are we having fun yet? Yes. We're really getting there. We're like, we're, we're over halfway done. Okay. 
And can you see pretty clearly? Yes. Okay. You keep doing your thing. Okay. Don't I'm worry just, about this thing. I'm, I'm doing my thing. Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Like a living pick and place machine. I know. <laughs> ka chunk, ka chunk. Ka chunk, ka chunk. Yeah, even a pick and place is faster, but you know what? This is just this is just part of the process. You do this for your prototype, you get your prototype up and running, and then you can uh one thing is when we made the um we did the uh, Charlie Plex matrices, that was like, oh boy, 144 LEDs. Not fun. We did it. But uh, it was like definitely, you know, really wanted to make sure the PCB design was good before sawing together a prototype of that Charlie Matrix. It was 144 LEDs. Okay, so we did the op amp section for the microphone, so this little amplification area. We got that um, accelerometer. We've got um, the uh, diode and, sorry, the uh, input part for the speaker and I'll do the speaker. So we need to get a buzzer. These buzzers are so cute. So they're actually little speakers inside. Should I open one up to show it off? I don't know if you can yeah, see. Yeah, you can do it. Yeah, I mean, this is, this, I'm not going to do this again. So if you... Pretty sure no one else is going to do this again. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, when you, when you get buzzers, you're like, oh, it's like a piezo. It's not. It's actually a little speaker. So if you cut it open, so you see that disc? It's like a little speaker, and there's a little magnet. See there's a speaker magnet inside? I don't know if you can see it. Yeah, I'm going to zoom in so stay right where you are. Okay. Yeah, it's a speaker. Yeah, see that little coil? And then this is the speaker disc, this you know, magnetic speaker yeah, disc. Small. It's a little electromagnetic speaker. I mean, it's it's small, but it it works. Yeah. That's you know, cool. we actually uh, were working on getting the um, talkie library to work with this. Yeah. Because, you know, it doesn't have a little screen. So we're like, well, how are we going to have it, you know, tell you things? And then we realized the talkie library, it, it doesn't have a lot of words that it can use but you know basic numbers yeah that's enough so it might be able to say you know like for example a pedometer it would say like 10,000 steps you yeah know, something very basic like that that's yeah, smart good so idea be fun and one of the nice things about this is so you know why not use a piezo well first off piezos they tend not to be as small and um, for reasons I'm not 100% sure of they never come in uh, surface mount friendly packages. So you really are, if you want to have something pick and placed, you do have to spend a little bit more and get a, a buzzer, but, and I'll actually talk about it revision. So as we, you know, you know, I basically have this developer edition. The developer edition was actually, it, it really was designed for like, okay, I don't know if this is gonna work out, but let's let's try this. And, and this is what I think is is the finished one, but it, it might not be. And, um, as we were as we're doing more and more, I realized like, well, I want to actually change some of the pin setups. Like, I want to change the pin that the NeoPixels are on. And then um, I actually was, you know, I was thinking, would I want to add more sensors? But I decided not to add more sensors. But I did decide to spend a little bit more and get a proper Class D amplifier for the speaker because it just turns out that you know you can get pretty good quality out of the speaker if you have a class D amp and if you have a like a class A amp it, it just isn't loud enough like you're not going to get one second just figure out which polarity I've got here get this diamond in um, and I found a class D amplifier for like 15 cents which you know what I was like eh, it's worth it 15 cents in, ex in exchange for um, you know, you, you don't need to, you know, you, you don't need two parts, like three parts I actually get to take out. I don't need to have um, the diode or the uh, driving transistor, and you get really, really good quality audio. And we were thinking, you know, if we can get talkie to work, that's worth it. 
I think. Cause remember we were talking about this, you know, a few months ago, like, you know, what, what, would good audio be worth it? But yeah. I didn't come up with the idea of like, oh, it can actually speak words. I, I didn't think of that idea. I was like, oh, we'll do sound effects. And you were like, well, can I do sound effects without a class amp? And I was like, yeah, they're, you know, it'll just beep and blurp. But then um, we came up with an idea as we were prototyping, coming up with uh, projects and designs that kind of necessitated, like we came up with a use case that was so compelling that it's like, okay, I gotta do a hardware redesign. Yeah. If that makes sense. Okay, let's do the switch. So sometimes as you're doing your, your prototyping, you'll, you'll come up with use cases that are like, oh, you know what, if I just change you know, a, a slight component, it'll make a big difference. Okay, so this is the switch. Um, another thing is, you know, as we were, were doing the light sensor testing, Phil B realized like, hey, you know, you can um, use it as a pulse sensor. Because remember we were, we were working with that max 31 100 sensor and then the next day we're like wait a minute this isn't that much different than what circuit playroom can do and so we realized like oh wow you know you can act like a pulse sensor and then we realized you can act like a color sensor so use cases that did appear to you at first when you're using it or when your user base is using it they'll come up with like hey it would be really cool if it did xyz and that might be a very minimal hardware change but if you manufacture 10,000 for your first run you're kind of screwed and that's why beta testing is really important Okay, I think we're just good so far. All right, any other questions? Uh, well, we have a couple about some um, enclosure stuff, but we'll do that when you get back to your computer. Okay, how, 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 what, what's my time? You're I'm, fine. I'm doing fine? Keep going. Okay. So the only thing is I made a mistake. I forgot to bring um, the microcontroller in oh, a bin. Yeah, yeah. So what I thought I would do is I would um, I would show removing a component, like why not? We'll just take yeah. the, take this advantage. It's a twofer. I do a twofer. Yeah, you see, I I remembered everything except for the um, the chip. Yeah. That happened. And that's all you got to do. This is it. Uh, then the NeoPixels. But I definitely have to do this last because they get damaged by hot air. Okay. Um, it's one of the things about LEDs. They do get damaged. So let me let me go back here and see if I can. Okay, so you found a ship? Yeah, so I found, sorry, just for the brief d uh, delay, I found an old board, one of my old purple boards, and um, I ended up kind of destroying the PCB, so I'm going to uh, rescue the chip off of this. So let's, let's show how to do that. That's a good skill to have when you're prototyping, is removing a chip. Yeah. And so this is the um, Atmega microcontroller. And I'm going to use my hot air and do the opposite. Instead of placing the part, I'm going to heat this part up and then I'm going to slowly remove it. I'm just going to bathe it in hot air. And then you just remove it. That's it. You see, got a nice fresh chip, like new. And uh, that way you can recycle parts. Especially if you have a very expensive sensor, you might want to, you know, rescue it. Okay, and then back to our main board. And I'm going to solder this component, this, this microcontroller, onto here, and that's the last big part. So I put a little bit of paste on the center. You really don't need that much. Um, it's used for centering. You know, it's a little bit mechanical. Um, it's not really electrical. Some chips have like, you know, you, you definitely need to have uh, an electrical contact with the ground pad. Just check the data sheet, but most don't. And then you spread some paste. Spread some more paste. Paste, 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 paste. Man, they really make this hard to squeeze. 
Mm, like strength training for soldering. Yeah. Okay, pretty good. And then just a little spot that I missed over here. Yeah, so it is a little bit easier, but I thought it was worth trying this. Okay. Whew. So now I'm going to get that chip in the right location. This is pin one. Don't forget to not mix up pin one. Boy, that's annoying if you do that. Pin one is in that top corner. Place it. Center it as best you can. And you can hand solder these QFNs because the, the leads come off the end. But um, we got this hot air gun, so why not? Just keep it in place. And then just go around and make, you know, kind of try to get it as evenly heated as possible. And then don't worry if there's like some bridging, you're gonna, you can clean that up pretty easily afterwards. For a big chip like this, you actually also might want a bigger nozzle, but you, you can go, you can go with a, a thinner nozzle, it's fine. You just have to move it around a little bit more. Melting so fast, so I'm going to change nozzles. It comes with a bunch of nozzles, so I'm going to go with the bigger one. Let's see if that helps. Don't forget, it's boiling hot. Don't grab with your fingers. The right nozzle for the right the job. Heat this up. Now you got like a little bit more, you got like more heat coming out, but the air, um, since you have like a, the same volume of air, the air is less strong, which is actually kind of good. You don't want too much air blowing. You just want to get like a, a slow uh, flow of air and a lot of heat. Okay, yeah, this is melting a little bit better now. Melt. Another thing you have to watch out for when you're using hot air is if you do it after you do some components like buttons or LEDs, those can melt. So you want to make sure you don't, you know, damage other components when you go to do your hot air. Okay, that's a pretty good hot air. In. And then you can again use the um, soldering iron to clean it up, which you'll almost certainly have to do, and that's normal. And then you kind of do a drag soldering to uh, clean it up.
This side's actually pretty good, but I'll still... Oh, and then clean. Okay. Yeah, that's nice. So yeah, you want to get Nice little bumps all the way around. Okay. All right, that's it. That's all the components. All right. Yeah. So the LEDs are a little tough. I'll solder in one and then um, we can try this out. So let's try the new pixel. Neopixels are surprisingly difficult to hand solder. They don't really like it, but <laughs> um, they don't. They're not. They're you know they're sensitive to temperature, and so it's I only like to to be handled by a machine now too. Yeah, no, I mean the cold precision. I want a mammal. You don't want a mammal. Yeah, you can Moving if you're around. very fast. You can do it, but I will say. They are not a fan of hand soldering or um, non-delicate machine soldering. So I'll just, I'll just warn you about that. Okay. Okay, so that's actually kind of it. So I'm, I'm going to skip ahead because I... Right. Uh, the other nine LEDs are basically the same, but this is this is pretty much the process. Okay. Um, you brought up a board. Now what? So you brought up a board. So um, then what you have to do is, okay, so you're like, you brought up the board, and then for the first time you're going to program it, you're probably going to, you know, if you have, for example, uh, programming pads. A lot of times you have a JTAG programming pad or ISP programming pad on the back. You'll actually want to, this is like, you know, the first prototype. Remember, I got those purple PCBs. So this is the first prototype. So I actually made... Um, a mistake. I had a, a wire that needed to be bridging and I needed a 10K resistor. So that, that's kind of a process. And then I soldered on the ISP header myself, just using, you know, small wires. And um, that's how you program the chip because you're going to have to need to program it or connect to the debugging interface. Um, you do have to think about how you're going to program it in manufacture. That, that's something that you have to think about. You know, if you need to have a Windows computer, you're going to have to think, okay, there's a Windows computer involved. Um, what's nice about using um, uh, AVRs is you can program them from other AVRs, which I kind of like. So this is actually an Arduino, which is going to program this Arduino compatible. And so this board, um, you know, it's red now because it's like, hey, there's, there's nothing here to test. But if you take, um, you know, the circuit playground and um, you power it over USB, um, it's already running this test code, but see yeah. these pogo pins over here? Can you see them? Yeah. So those touch the pogo pins on the back, and then when you place this into the testing jig, and these little clamps hold it down, it will um, hold it in place while the pogo pins on the bottom um, touch all the, the board and all the testing locations. Oh, you know, it's funny. It's testing the um, thermistor, and it's like, uh, it's way too hot. Yeah. So this is a little bit of a, a trade-off of, uh, of, of, you know, you, that's actually nothing you have to think about. If something you're doing is temperature sensitive, you might have to wait a certain amount Let of time. Cool off and then... Yeah, until after it's done. So that's yeah. kind of funny. But um, that's, you know, part of the, the testing procedure is coming up with this test jig, which is a whole other design. How do you design something that has all the pins in the right locations? How can you program it quickly? Let me, let me off chance it's cooled down a little bit. Hold on. Um, how to you know how to test all the components? So for example, you know we have a speaker. How do you test the speaker on a device? Like, do you, do you make it uh, play a tone? Do you 
um, have like a the person who's testing, do they have to listen for something? Like not having a, a human involved in the test procedure is ideal. If you can do it completely in a mechanized fashion, that's like kind of the best way to do it. Yeah, it's a little too warm in here, but normally it would go through the test procedure and it would it would program it in with, you know, the, the blink sketch or whatever. So this is this is something that you should think about, like while you're doing um, your prototyping, coming up with your test jigs at the same time will let you quickly build prototypes and program them like very fast. I got tired of soldering the um, ISP on the back and so I created like a very generic version of this jig. It was really like you had to hold it up against the board, but it was good enough for me to just sort of get started with, okay, program in the bootloader. So that's the bring up. You have a tester, you test it, solder in all the components, and hopefully the first time you bring it up, you'll, you'll get something going. I know that one of the frustrating things about bring up is uh, sometimes it doesn't work at all. And so then yeah. you're gonna have to figure out like, well, what is it that's broken? Sometimes it's the power supply, sometimes your reset circuitry, um, sometimes you solder a component backwards and it's like pulling down a line. So that's, that's a joyous part. And that's why I always build three boards when I do prototypes. I never build just one at a time, I actually build three in parallel. Um, and that way, if there's a, a short or a bridge, you know, sometimes the bridges are underneath the chip, um, I'll catch that um, because like, I'll, I'll do the same test on all three. And if all three have the same issue, I know it's probably a PCB design problem or a component selection problem. Whereas if only one of them exhibits the problem, it's like, okay, this is probably um, you know, an issue with my soldering. Hand soldering is, is just not as precise as machine soldering. Okay. Um, so let's do a couple questions uh, back at your desk. Okay, hold on. I just want to, just curious if, no, see, it doesn't pass test. Ah, so sad. All right, so let's go back to the desk. All right. Okay, so bring all your stuff over. Yes. Right. We're back. Back to whew, home base. Yeah. Okay, so this board's cooled it. off a little bit, so we can try it again over here. It's also a little easier to debug it, but um, okay, I'll okay, get the overhead. Okay, so this is um, the basic tester I've got going, and um, I use an Arduino Zero actually to program Arduinos because I have code that can like program an ABR um, over just you know the ISP pins, and like you can bit bang it. It's quite easy to bit bang, unlike. Uh, ARM chips, which need, you know, SWD is a lot tougher. And then I have an LCD that helps the person who's testing it. It should be really clear what's going on. And then, yeah, the pogo bed with a um, little happy face. This just tells you, so like, you know, if the cable is plugged in backwards, you'll know it's plugged in backwards. It should be this face up, just a little happy face. Um, so you can plug this in. Oh, sorry, wrong cable. Don't forget to plug the right cable in. Plug in the power cable. And what's really nice about the um, the ARM boards is that the uh, the zero is that it can use USB. It has a native USB port, and so you can do USB enumeration testing. So. Okay, you're out of focus. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to focus back in. Okay, so um, yeah, when you plug in the fresh board, you just get the power light because there's no bootloader, there's nothing on it. So you, it's bare board. You have to take it from completely blank board to, you know, programmed. So let's try this again. This time, all cooled off. Okay, so um, it says, okay, press button. So that, uh, sorry, well, let's do a fresh reset. Okay, so it says it does a quick power test because it was red before and it verifies that the, the board is in place. So then it says press button. So you press the middle button. And then it's going to flash the test program on. So it's doing ISP programming. And you heard that beep. It actually uses the piezo to, or the buzzer to test the speaker. It makes a little um, beepy sound. And that beeping sound is detected, the frequency is detected by the speaker. So we'll do it again because it happened really fast. So we'll reset. And the program. See that beep? So yeah, so it beeps. And then it says, okay, press left. And there's a, a white LED over here. When you press the left button, all the LEDs turn red because one of the failure modes for the LEDs is that 
one of the three dyes goes bad. So like red will go out or green will go out or blue will go out. So when you press left, it turns all the LEDs red. And then you let go and it says, okay, press right. And then all the LEDs are blue. And then once it passes both of those tests, you verified, the person verified they're red and blue, it will program in the bootloader and program in the um, initial software. So when you first get the board, this is actually the, the demo it's running. And so it's programmed in the bootloader and the test program all in once, which is really nice because when the user gets it, they plug it in and immediately does something. That's actually kind of handy. If you're making a maker tool and you can have it do anything, even if it's not like the default thing, just something to show the user like, yes, you soldered it in correctly. Like that will make it a lot easier for them if they don't have to worry about like nothing is happening when I plug it in. So what's nice about getting Circuit Playground is when you plug it in, something happens. So now when the user gets it, it boots right into the test program. So that's kind of nice. Okay. And then you can verify the bootloaders there by looking for the pulsing LED. And in the test code, it actually checks the enumeration to make sure that the USB enumerated because that's like the most important thing. If it doesn't show up as a USB device, like nobody can do anything. All right, so we're gonna right. do a couple questions and then we're outie. Bring up, yes. Okay, so first question is, um, now that you're already with the um, prototype done, it's probably time to do certifications. Tell us about how, what, when, and where you would do FCC and CE. Yes. So you don't what want. Does, what, what are those? Okay. So when this is a non emitter, this is not a radio device. It doesn't have Wi Fi or Bluetooth or cellular. And so you do have to do some basic FCC testing, but it's very inexpensive because it's not a radio. You don't have to test the radio. And um, so FCC and C certification usually get done by the same house. They'll also do telex sometimes. and. I think ICES, there's some Canadian certification. There's a whole bunch. And they'll do them all at once, basically. Like, they put it into a room and they perform emitter tests. They just verify, like, it isn't radiating anything. You, it depends on what you're building. You may want to do it at the prototype stage, but you'll probably want to do it once you get to a point where you think you're close to done. Like, you wouldn't do it on the first prototype, but maybe you do it on the third prototype. Um, and then... You know, you may have to do it multiple times. Of course, if it doesn't pass, you're gonna to have to go back and redo it. The good news is it's not too expensive. You know, I have um, a house that I have do all my certification, and it's like like a thousand dollars to do all three: the ICES, CE, and FCC. And then you get to, of course, put um, the FCC and CE logo on the back, which is going to be really useful. If you want to sell this into schools, if you want to get it out as a product, you're going to need the FCC certification. Again, it's not that hard. Like, unless you're doing something with extremely, you know, powerful motor driving or um, extremely high-speed microprocessor with, uh, you know, the, with the, the data lines are all over the place. If it's all compact, if you keep everything together, have a good ground plane, you should just pass certification unless you're doing something kind of weird. But most maker projects, especially Arduino-based ones, should like just work. OK. And then um, for enclosures, when would you start to consider doing uh, enclosure design? This is good timing, because we actually have a um, little. Yeah, it's a, a project that Noah and Pedro have done for Circuit Playground. And um, what I normally try to do is, again, once you have the design kind of in the final shape, You'll use 3D printing because it's really the way to go. There's no, nothing beats 3D printing for prototyping your enclosure design. Prototype your enclosure with 3D printing, and you might even want to print like the first 10 or 20 on a 3D printer because getting injection molding done is going to cost you at least $10,000. There's no way around it. They just, it's $10,000 to get injection at the minimum. The very minimum, it's 10K. And so you don't want to do that unless you're absolutely sure that, um, you need to get injection molding done and you have the design finished. You can modify a mold once it's complete, but you're going to incur $1,000, 2000 $3,000 costs. And, and you know, if the, depending on what it is, you might have to refinish the mold. It can be a real pain in the ass. So you want to try to um, do as much 3D printing design as possible in the beginning to really figure out what your um, package is going to be. And then go and get injection molding done. And you can do stuff like proto mold. We'll do like short run. Um, I think you can get like, you know, they'll do aluminum molds that can do, I think, like 500 pulls. But when you get to, to real production, like 10,000 pieces, yeah, you need to you need to spend quite a bit. Okay. And uh, on the overhead, can you show the little circuit playground um, 
Yes. We even we did. So yes, yeah, so this is a, a prototype that we might actually end up getting injection molded. So this is, was a great um, project to do. And um, this fits the circuit playground inside of it. Oh, and you know, I need my uh, little battery. One second. Oh, will actually, uh, I've got batteries over here. So you can power your circuit playground from a battery and take it on the go. And of course, you'd use a, a smaller battery. This is just a demo. And then you can, for a small battery, you can, can tuck it underneath for a little wearable that you can uh, wear. So, you know, there's some projects that you could do. Um, it's not, you know, it's, it's larger, but it's not crazy large. I mean, like, I have a... You know, it's like one of those Android watches. Yeah, it's, a, <laughs> it's Android watch size. Um, but some projects, you know, maybe a pedometer or um, music reactive project would be yeah. a good one for, for this. And then this has little nubs. But, um, you know, this is, this is a 3D printed uh, flexible filament. You can, you can do quite a bit. Okay, and so we have a learn guide on this, and then yeah. if you if you could, yes, of course, um, maybe show. I'm trying to get this on, it's like bracelet. Okay, yeah, show the, this design or the the, the tutorial. Um, go scroll up. Okay. And since something reverse, like click the the, oh, the, clay? the round one on the right, all the way to the right. Yeah, that one. Yeah. And like click thing view. Thing view. Yeah, and then Whoa. like spin it around. Yeah. So anyways. Whoa! I didn't even know about this. thing view. Yeah. And then you can do that on the strap and thing right Wow. There. Yeah, and this is done in um, a CAD software where you can change the parameters as well. So that might be something interesting to try out. But, you know, we have um, you know, the, the Pi Girl project. We don't sell a case with it. You have to 3D print it, but it's still yeah. very popular. Thousands of people have built it. People will find a way. If, they, if, they really, if you have a really cool case, they'll figure it out. You know, you don't have to injection mold a case, too. You can use bent metal. You can, um, like we talked about before, you can use a, a pre-made case in a certain shape, so um, if you're in a digikey, I really like you know, like Hammond cases. Um, and their boxes, I mean, there's like hundreds and hundreds of different box options, but like, yeah. you know, maybe mm -hmm. one of these enclosures, you could punch, like this one, you know, it's a strap. If you can get this punched or modified, it's gonna be a lot less expensive and you're only gonna pay, you know, a couple hundred dollars for setup fees rather than ten thousand dollars. One of those right. nice cases. A lot of options. Okay, so um, next week we're going to be into the funding. Yeah. So we'll talk about how we actually do all this stuff. I'm going to launch how you this. Pay for it. Yes. And uh, you know maybe we'll have fun and pretend that it was. If we were to be a, uh, do a Kickstarter, how much money would we want or need to make it work out? and all those things. So yeah. um, with that, I'm going to leave it, instead of just the outro, the lady, desk of lady outro, we're going to do the um, little circuit playground video that Noam Pager did with the 3D print, yes. uh, printing. So I'm going to play that now. Okay, go for it. All right. All right. See you next See week. See you all next week. That was... Prototyping. Prototyping. Okay, here we go. Circuit Playground is our new all-in-one board aimed towards education and beginners. It features 10 NeoPixel LEDs, a motion sensor, a temperature sensor, mini speaker, sound sensor, a light sensor, two buttons, and a switch. We think it's a great way to practice programming on real hardware with no soldering or sewing required. The onboard Atmega 32U4 processor is Arduino compatible, so you can program it with the Arduino IDE and upload your code via micro USB. It also has a JST connector, so you can plug in a battery to make your projects portable. To make it a wearable, we designed and 3D printed a simple bumper and a two-piece strap so we can wear it on our wrist. NinjaFlex filament is really flexible material and it's perfect for strong and super flexible projects. The straps are inserted into slots on the bumper and each strap has an extended end to act as a stopper. One strap has holes for different size wrists and the other one has a little nub so we can snap the two together. A 
small LiPo battery can be tucked away in between the straps or underneath the board. We designed the parts in Autodesk Fusion 360 with user parameters, so anybody can easily change the length or width of the straps. The Pokemon Go project by Richard Albrighton turned Circuit Playground into a team badge. NeoPixels light up and the motion sensor detects movement and flashes them white. You can also cycle through team colors using the onboard button. There's tons of other projects you can make with Circuit Playground and we have a playlist full of project ideas and tutorials. So be sure to check them out and subscribe for more projects from Adafruit.